Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and today from Auto House of Naples on a gorgeous, I can't lie, it's an absolutely gorgeous Naples, Florida morning. I mean the temperature is like in the high 50s. I'm wearing a light sweater. It's just, you know, this is what I've waited the last eight months of absolute misery for and it's finally here and I'm chipper and I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to, you know, I mean, look, this weather really brings out, it's an interesting time in Naples because you get weather like this, it brings out some of the uh, complainers and also the bullies. I mean, you've got these people who complained about the hot weather for eight months. All of a sudden it dips down into the 50s and, uh, you know, they act like they're living in the Arctic Circle and it's just pathetic. The flip side of that is it also brings out the bullies, you know. It was kind of chilly last night. I'm out in the garage smoking because I don't smoke in the house. My lady friend gets very offended by that. I have to have a fan blowing the smoke outside. So I asked my sister for a, uh, for a space heater. And she said, oh, you need a heater. I mean, no, I don't need a heater, but you know, when you're outside, it's 57 degrees, the fan is blowing on you, it's not bad to have, so, you know, it just is one of these things that it just brings out the absolute worst in people, but I don't care, the weather is fantastic, I'm absolutely loving it, and uh, I'm not going to cry at all. Uh, this is the second video I've done since the hurricane, if you remember, uh, it was in the news and all that, uh, Hurricane Ian came through uh, at the end of September and uh, wreaked some havoc on this area and uh, it wreaked some havoc frankly on my little operation and that's why we haven't seen too many videos I've just been kind of getting everything together uh, I also got a gig appraising destroyed collector car collections which you know maybe I'll get into I don't know that it's a very sad thing actually it makes me very very sad uh, but the hurricane recovery is well underway and Naples you know is specifically well suited for it uh, you know even with this rare and weird storm surge that came along which frankly we all joked about because they'd been predicting a storm surge since 1975 and it never came well it finally came with this this one it took a lot of people by surprise and uh, actually did some damage around Naples but you know it, it, we're it, well suited to hurricanes we recover quickly and uh, frankly a week after the storm the only difference between normal and then is you know all the yard waste in the front yards and uh, you know a limited menu at Taco Bell so it's just not that unusual and uh, you drive through downtown Naples now you'd never know any of this happened it just you know it, it just changes that quick uh, the car valuation thing a friend of mine got me into it it was actually Penelope uh, had no interest in it but you know it seems like fairly easy money so what the hell uh, you know the storm surge wiped out a ton of really nice car collections and uh, you know it sounded great when she called me and said hey look you got to go out to this address and document the damage and the, he said yeah okay you know X amount of dollars per car it sounds fantastic I went out there and seeing these cars in this condition I feel like one of these people who works with cancer kids or something. It's just, you know, a viper doesn't deserve to die a slow death in salt water. It should die on a racetrack in a fiery crash. It just makes much more sense. So um, it's been very hard on me, and I'm not even sure I should continue, but I probably will. Uh, but uh, anyway, look, all that aside, this is the first proper weather that we've had in a long time. I'm joyous. Again, the light sweater, I'm wearing jeans, I mean, it is just terrific, and I'm absolutely so glad it's here. You know, I'm sure before too long we're going to get some hot and miserable, unseasonable weather, uh, but while this is going on, I'm absolutely going to enjoy it. Uh, again, sorry for all the long-winded you know news but if I'm not doing many videos then I gotta gotta get this all in uh, I recently I wouldn't call it a health scare but I had a little bit of a health issue and I'm not going to get into the details because it's disgusting uh, but long story short I had to do a I had to give a stool sample to the doctor and they gave me this kit 
but they ran out of whatever this thing is they called hats, which was the way to collect it. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, oh, what the hell am I supposed to do? I mean, should I buy a Frisbee on the way home? You know, how am I going to come up with this stuff? And I failed the first test because apparently I didn't put enough material into the vials that they gave me and I was not going to make that mistake the second time so despite these vials having the world's smallest little spoon in them I filled the, I mean it was in the threads of the vial it was spilling over the top whoever had to you know unpack these things definitely had to go through a hazmat shower and that definitely made me feel a little better but look without getting too disgusting and I can't even believe I'm talking about it at all uh, everything's clear I'm fine I had some stupid little thing that's like a third world bacteria and uh, I'm now on some sort of antibiotic to fix it the thing about that is the doctor told me that if I took alcohol while I was taking this antibiotic, I would become violently ill. And I labored over the decision whether or not to um, uh, to drink alcohol before this video, you know, to do my coronavirus whiskey. Uh, and I decided the hell with it. I'm going to do it. So if I get violently ill during this video, you'll know what happened. Uh, for my birthday, which was, you know, a few weeks ago, I, I, they, my sister gave me some bourbon called Blanton's or something. It was very fancy looking. It came with a net around the bottom and a little horse on top. And uh, I'm sure it was awfully expensive, but whatever. It went into the... Uh, uh, into the goat flask and I've had a big share of it this morning enough to keep the coronavirus at bay keep the Russians away you know all the other stuff that um, that whiskey is good for you know making hurricanes more palatable and uh, we'll see we'll see if I can make it through the video without going and puking in Peter's bushes um, that's basically it. You know, look, I apologize for not doing many videos. I've got a ton of cars to do. Uh, they're just piling up in the back, including stuff I've bought myself. I've got a Cosworth Vega. That's going to make a terrific video. Uh, off a of Widow the other day, I bought a 66 Belvedere and uh, a 1977 Dodge Bang Van, something from the Cozy Car Company, which uh, it seems they gave up making vans and went into having exotic dancing nightclubs or something so I can't wait to do that video that one's gonna write itself and uh, there it is so look there's the quick news and we're gonna dive directly into this particular car which is a 1966 Ford Mustang convertible now you know, I have a channel called Curious Cars, which, you know, sort of implies that they're going to be a little bit weirder outside the box. And this thing is anything but. I mean, it is... Look, it's inarguably two things. I mean, one of the, it was the most successful vehicle launch since, like, the Model T. I mean, it's an incredibly, incredibly successful car from the day that it came out. And uh, number two, it's probably as well-known as I, and iconic uh, as any other vehicle in automotive history. So sitting here and looking at the car in my viewfinder, I well know that this is not something that, you know, people don't know. There's basically every human being on earth with few exceptions uh, are gonna know this uh, you know first generation Mustang and that's fine I haven't done one before I you know found this one sitting over at Auto House it was a great car and I thought what the hell we're gonna do it it's a six cylinder I know I'm gonna get some flack for that you know everybody wants you to do like the you know 429 Shelby GT 500 or something well what the hell with it look when this came out it was kind of known as the secretary car and I think having one in this six-cylinder convertible configuration is as true to the original plan as uh, you know any other example you're gonna find the, the muscle car stuff from these cars came later this was the car as the original creators intended and I'm very happy to do it that way so uh, the Mustang is a name obviously in uh, automotive history we're currently in the sixth generation uh, which really you know look you get into like Rivieras they're in like they were in their 10th generation and uh, you know so obviously Mustangs ran for a long time after they came up with them I think it's absolutely bizarre 
uh, that uh, the 64 and a half, truly the 65, you know, a Mustang that looks like this is considered the same body style as one that was that came out in 71 because they look very different, uh, but it's still technically the first generation. So uh, that's why we're only in the six now. And uh, it's the longest running nameplate in, that Ford has. And, you know, even though they claim to be proud of that, don't be fooled. Uh, they have tried to kill the Mustang multiple Multiple times, either intentionally or unintentionally, and uh, it's really only the die-hard fans who kept it all going. Uh, it's the nameplate. It's the namesake, I should say, for the pony car class. Um, you know, there's some argument about the Barracuda and some other cars, but truly, this was the first real pony car, uh, which became an absolute mainstay in the automotive industry. And frankly, you know, it wouldn't be called a pony car if this car was the Mustang. Uh, but over the years, it's been a muscle car, it's been a large person, a luxury car, a small economy car, and uh, even today it's a uh, weird-looking four-door electric SUV. So uh, Ford hasn't hesitated to slap this nameplate on just about anything they make. And uh, it's, you know, like the saxophone is the most abused history or sorry, most abused instrument in music. I would argue the Mustang is one of the most abused nameplates in automotive history. Uh, but anyway, they're still around and here they are. Uh, getting back to this car, there's some debate about how the name came to be. Uh, the majority of people believe that it came from a guy, an executive stylist. His name was John Nadger, uh, and he co-designed the first car to have the name, uh, which was an engineering concept and a publicity exercise called the Mustang One. You know, that's a little bit weird to me because the first in a series is rarely named the One. I mean, it's like, you know, you didn't go and watch The Godfather Part One in the movie theater. You know, it was just The Godfather. And then, yeah, the second one came out and it was the two. Uh, but that car was actually officially named with one in the name, which I think is pretty friggin' strange and uh, kind of an indication of how weird Ford was at the time. But that's an aside. Uh, Najjar was an aviation nut, absolutely loved it, and uh, purportedly named the car for the North American Aviation P-51 Mustang uh, fighter plane, which was a World War II plane of, you know, tremendous fame, very, very cool piece, and uh, supposedly that's what this car was named for. Uh, there's another faction, a little bit smaller, uh, which thinks a guy named Robert Egger, who was a Ford uh, market research manager and he was a big fan of quarter horses and they claim that you know he named the Mustang his wife had given him a book on quarter horses and you know that's where the name came from well it doesn't friggin matter at all because if it was named for the airplane the airplane was actually named for a horse so you know either directly or indirectly uh, the, the thing is named for a horse, I mean, without a doubt. So, you know, that's where it came from. And that's where it is. There were other names considered. Uh, they were going to call it the Torino initially. That was a name that was in the works. They were going to call it the Cougar. In fact, some of the early mock-ups had a Cougar badge in the front. That, of course, would be a Mercury later on. And then Henry Ford II, brilliant guy, uh, he wanted to name it the uh, Thunder Thunderbird 2, because presumably Thunderbird 1 was already taken. And, you know, I mean, what a stupid name that would have been. Uh, but anyway, look, so the Mustang 1 was this mid-engine fiberglass affair. Uh, it very serious Corvette overtones, but it was, um, it was kind of an exercise in engineering and also publicity. They drove it around to colleges. They wanted to appeal to youth. Uh, Ford and uh, Lee Iacocca, who was, uh, you know, rising star within the company at the time and had become Ford's, uh, at least the Ford GM, uh, sorry, the, the Ford division GM, you know wanted to appeal to the youth, and uh, that was a way to do it. And the Corvette... Oh, God. Sorry. The Mustang won you know, was brought around all these campuses, it was shown, it was raced by Dan Gurney, and uh, it really tied into the sort of increasingly sporty 
vibe at the time. And uh, Iacocca wanted to build something that would appeal to this rising class of baby boomers who were coming of age, they were starting to buy cars, they wanted something different from what their parents drove. So he came up with this theory that they were going to build a uh, low slung sporty car that would have bucket seats and a floor shifter and uh, you know be pretty cool and well priced under 2500 bucks uh, which is about tw yeah, 20 grand in today dollars uh, frankly wait another week or two it'll probably be 25 grand but you know there it is uh, but anyway, so the Mustang One, the, the concept, became the T5 project. And uh, that car, the T5, became this car uh, within 18 months. I mean, it was absolutely rushed to the forefront. Uh, there was some argument involved. Henry Ford II didn't want to make it. I mean, he was stung from the failure of the whole Edsel thing. Uh, you had a guy named, uh, uh, what the hell was his name? Donald Fry. Frey. He was the guy who designed this car uh, with another dude. And he was pushing hard for it with Iacocca. And uh, apparently Henry Ford II came down to the design division, met up with uh, Donald and said, you know, look, this is on you. I don't want this car, but if you say it's going to work, we'll do it. But if it fails, it's going to be on your ass. And uh, there it was. <laughs> so anyway, it came out and uh, at the end of the day, Donald got to keep his job because without question, this was one of the most successful vehicle launches in automotive history. I mean, it was it went so far beyond their expectations. Uh, they had expected to sell about 100,000 of these things a year. Uh, they ran three ads on all the major networks simultaneously on April the 16th, 1964. It was going to be released the next day. It was going to debut at the New York World's Fair. And 22,000 sold the very first day. The first day. There were actually people camping out at Ford dealerships to be the first ones around to buy Mustangs. So uh, it immediately succeeded well beyond their wildest dreams. And uh, that was, um, you know, it was a credit to, you know, there was some dumb luck. There was some incredibly good timing. There was some terrific marketing strategy and a variety of things. But whatever it was, it all came together and uh, absolutely made this car an absolute smash hit uh, right from the beginning. Just absolutely brilliant. Um, they were able to keep pace with that because they had based the car on existing Ford products. And this was a bit of brilliance for Mayakoka. Uh, the underpinnings were basically uh, the Ford Falcon. You know, these parts already existed. They were already there. Quite a bit of the interior was from the Ford Falcon. So it was really easy for dealers to keep up with, uh, you know, having parts on hand. It was really easy for their production departments to keep the cars pumping out of the factory uh, because so many of the parts on this car were already in existence. Uh, it was just basically new sheet metal, and that wasn't that hard for them to come up with. So, uh, you know, they were advertised in magazines and TV, coast to coast. Uh, they appeared in a James Bond movie, Goldfinger, I think, was the first one to uh, show the Mustang, driven by a sexy lady, you know, running around with uh, James Bond and his Aston Martin, having a little race around the countryside. And uh, yeah, they even took one apart piece by piece, put it in the elevators at the uh, Empire State Building and brought it up to the observation deck uh, to be reassembled. So uh, before too long, the Mustang was absolutely everywhere and uh, Lee Iacocca had sealed himself uh, into automotive history as a, you know, a brilliant manager. Whether he deserved it or not, whether it came from his people or not, uh, it really reflected well on Iacocca and frankly just made him a legend in the car world. Uh, you know, and it all would have been great if Ford didn't screw the whole thing up about six years later. Uh, they hired Bunky Knudsen. We talked about that guy. He basically had rescued Pontiac from being a dowdy old company and turned it into GM's performance division. Well, uh, Ford headhunted him 
him, cherry picked him, brought him in, and then tasked him with turning the later first gen Mustang into kind of a big bloated personal luxury coupe. <laughs> I mean, it made no sense at all. I mean, by 71, Ford had gone from making these sort of sporty, great Mustangs into making these big bloated things that just didn't work well for him at all. A couple of years after that, they made a Pinto-based Mustang II, and uh, obviously that must have been named by Henry Ford, and uh, that just didn't do very well either. So, you know, Ford just seemed to do everything in their power to screw up the Mustang name. And uh, I think Lee Iacocca once said, you know, look, the Mustang market never, never left. Uh, we left it, you know, we screwed it up, and uh, there is an absolute lot of truth to that. They really wouldn't reinvent the Mustang and reinvigorate it until the Fox body came out in 1979, and uh, even then, a couple of years later, until the GT with the uh, 302 came out, and uh, that was sort of the rebirth of the Mustang. Uh, later on, they tried to screw it up by making the Ford Probe a Mustang, and uh, only some diehards within the company rescued it from that. And then after 93, they were going to discontinue it, and again, a bunch of diehards worked their asses off in a remote location uh, to actually save the Mustang and keep it going. So if you hear Ford being proud of, you know, the Mustang running as long as it has and being this great iconic car, uh, don't necessarily believe them because they did everything they could to screw the whole thing up. So uh, another guy who's synonymous with the Mustang is Carroll Shelby. Uh, but he had strongly distanced himself from this car when it came out. He was the one who famously called it a secretary's car. He didn't like the setup. He didn't like the engines. He thought it was crap. And uh, Iacocca came to him and said, look, man, we got to turn this thing into a muscle car. You got to give me some pep in this thing. And he really resisted. You know, he was, uh, if you watch that Ford versus Ferrari movie. These Mustangs do play heavily into it. You'll see them in there. Uh, but Iacocca really pressured Shelby to make the Mustang into a muscle car. Despite the resistance, he actually did. And uh, you came up with like the Shelby GT350, the GT500, the GT500KR, which means king of the road. That's typical Shelby nomenclature. And uh, those things are now some of the most collectible and interesting muscle cars of the 60s. So, uh, you know, Shelby did bring it all together, and the Mustang probably eventually was as kind to him as he was to it. So, uh, that went on. You know, the thing spawned a lot of competitors. Uh, GM got into the game with the Camaro and the Firebird. You had DeLorean coming up with the Firebird stuff. Uh, AMC brought in the Javelin. Chrysler brought in the Challenger. Uh, even Toyota brought on the Celica, which was inspired by the Mustang. And uh, Mercury got the Cougar, which became kind of an upscale, fancier Mustang. So, um, and in fact, when the Cougar got too big and weird, they brought over the Capri from Europe to sort of be another Mustang. So the car had an absolutely enormous impact on automotive history and uh, has become, of course, one of the hollowed names. So, you know, look, long story short, while Mustang history can absolutely fill volumes and volumes, I'm going to leave it there. That's essentially the briefest story of the birth of this first generation Mustang. And yeah, I know I left a lot of stuff out. I apologize. Probably screwed up some other stuff the purists are going to correct me on. But the hell with it. That's it. So uh, that is basically how this car came to be and uh, how it was so ultimately successful. I'm going to take a little break there. When we come back, we're going to get into the exterior styling, the interior, the trunk, and we're going to talk about why, you know, this is one of the easiest and best collector cars to own, uh, particularly for people who aren't really into collector cars. They just want to have one without all the trouble and fuss uh, that surround a lot of them. So uh, anyway, bear with me a moment. We'll uh, take a break and we'll come back. All right, we're back. And I mean, man, is this weather nice. I just can't, I, you know, I love to complain. I'm not going to argue with that, but I just can't. This is absolutely perfect, and I'm loving it. Not a hint of humidity in the air, 60-degree weather. This is 
one of the few days why I remember why I live in this godforsaken place in the first place. So anyway, we'll just get back into the car and talk about the exterior styling for a moment. While it makes sense now, and you know, it seems like, you know, not that really outside the box, at the time it was pretty advanced and pretty forward thinking. Uh, originally there were coupes and convertibles like this one. Uh, a, few, a couple months later they added a 2 plus 2 Fastback, which is a really beautiful car. Uh, that's a bullet fame. If you remember that movie with Steve McQueen, uh, he was driving a Fastback against a Dodge Challenger at the time, which became one of the, you know, sort of epic car chases in movie history and cemented that name and that car into... Uh, uh, into automotive history to the point that Ford came out with a few bullet editions even to this day uh, It's a name that keeps going so that had quite an impact um, There was a guy named Joe uh, what that was his name Joe Oros and he was the chief stylist who was tasked with the Mustang and he made just absolute, maybe even a hundred different designs before they absolutely nailed it. And frankly, nailed it they did. I mean, we look at this car and, you know, they're so common and so popular, you don't really think about it. It's a sh it's a, another one of these cars that's almost a victim of its own success. Uh, but uh, if you really look at it, he absolutely just nailed the styling and got the right look, which almost could be considered a little bit Italian, certainly at the time. Uh, you've got these sort of thin and elegant wraparound bumpers. Uh, you've got these very attractive air scoops at the side that, you know, they have body lines going up all the way to the front headlights. You've got this long hood, which suggests a big engine underneath, which of course they didn't have initially, but you know, as time went on, they did. Uh, you've got this short deck lid, short trunk, which sort of suggests to people that you have this devil may care attitude and you know, you don't need that much crap. You'll get what you need when you get where you're going. And it just is a terrific looking car. Uh, even up front, and we'll get up to the front here, uh, there's this giant, frankly, really ridiculous looking medallion. I mean, it looks like one of these things you'd have with chest hair around it uh, in the front of the hood with the galloping pony. So um, he really did just absolutely nail the styling and I think that's why people went nuts for the car and why they sold so many of them. Uh, it also had an impressive color palette. Uh, a bunch of really cool colors. There were turquoises and reds and oranges and uh, this I think is a stunning color particularly for a six-cylinder convertible. Uh, it's called Springtime for Hitler Yellow and it looks terrific uh, particularly with the sort of um, wheel covers that mimic those uh, Magnum 500 rims or whatever the hell they were. I think it just looks great. Uh, you got the Fender emblems there with the Mustang and the red, white, and blue. Looks great. There's those vents we were talking about. Got a little bit of haunch going into the quarter panels. Uh, again, a very elegant uh, bumper that sort of blends nicely into the body. Uh, you've got um, the uh, taillights, you know, a three lens affair, which look pretty cool. Uh, the uh, Ford Mustang uh, big uh, fuel door there at the back. Um, you know, some of the other bunch of different options on these cars, and that was an Iacocca thing. Uh, the way they advertised it was you could get you know, this is a car that you can build the way you want. I mean, it's got this base price of under 2,500 bucks, about 27 for the convertible. Uh, but it was fairly affordable at the time for what it was. Uh, but man, did they have a lot of factory options that you could pile on. And Iacocca had the cars advertised as, you know, have them your way, like a Burger King cheeseburger or something. And uh, he was encouraging people to go in and start checking off option boxes, which they did. And uh, you could get a thing called trumpet exhaust, uh, at least on the V8 models, that uh, would come through about where those reverse lights are. Uh, reverse lights actually were an option in the earlier cars. And uh, there was just a wide variety of stuff you could get. Uh, the convertible tops, they were available in either black or white. They looked great. And uh, again, I just think the whole car has a really nice, clean look to it. I like the stainless trim on the rockers. Uh, I think the white walls look terrific on this car. I love the chrome uh, windshield frame. I think it looks really cool. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, all in all, I understand why they sold so many of these things. But, all right, let's get into the trunk. Let's see what we got there. The little upturned quarter panels. I mean, it, you know, look, man, again, I always say it's like the uh, 82 Camaro was a victim. They sold so many of them that you don't realize how good looking the thing is um, because they were just on every street corner. And the same was true with this Mustang. Uh, all right, so look, we get into the trunk. There's the spare tire, which, you know, in this day takes up just too much of the damn trunk. Um, it would have been nice if that could have been mounted underneath or something because, man, You've got a pretty good sized trunk. You could fit all kinds of little toddlers and shit in here, but uh, the way it is with that spare tire, yeah, I don't know. Um, forgive me, I've got my Remington 870 TAC 14 here. This is a great little gun. Let's see if I can pull it out there. Um, this one's going in the truck. Uh, I got some double hot buck that I'm going to put in there. It only holds five shots with one in the chamber, but that's probably enough to do what you need to do. And uh, I got to come up with a way to mount that under the seat. Uh, it's going to replace that uh, 870 uh, Marine Magnum that I have in the back because it just isn't working well. It's interfering with the toolbox under the seat. So I got to figure out that thing. But uh, yeah, anyway, forgive me. So I've got the sheath and the gun <laughs> as I'm transporting it but uh, it's a uh, yeah it'll make a it nice it'll become a force in nature if I need to on some of these runs over to the East Coast but long story short the trunk looks great you can get a lot of crap in there and um, yeah you know what more can you say about it Glad that didn't close because I wasn't sure I didn't throw the keys in the back there we go let's have a look under the hood Actually, this hood wasn't too bad to open, so let's see if I can duplicate that. Yeah, there's that. Oh, forgive me. All right, so here it is, and this is where I'm going to get a lot of shit from the guys who want to see at least 289 in here, if not something else. But again, you know, this is a secretary's car, and the vast majority of them came with this engine. Uh, you know, originally in 64 and a half, and you know, there were no 64 and a half Mustangs, not really. You know, some purists do talk about the first few that were made as that, but uh, if you go to the DMV, every Mustang from the first one was registered as a 1965. It just had a few extra months of production, uh, which is why at the end of the year, by the way, they had sold 418,000 of them in one year. Uh, by the time the 66 came out, they had sold a million of these cars. So it's just unbelievable how many uh, people went out there and bought Mustangs. Uh, but uh, anyway, the first ones you could get came with a 170 cubic inch inline six or a 260 uh, V8, uh, cubic inch V8 with a two barrel uh, or a uh, 289 four barrel with 210 horsepower. Uh, then in June, they came out with a GT model, which of course had a you know, long-standing history in the Mustang lineup. And that thing had a 271 horse, 289 with solid lifters. It was a pretty hot motor, uh, but there weren't too many of those. Uh, by the time this 66 rolled around, they'd bumped up the uh, 170 cubic inch to 200, uh, gave it, um, uh, what did it, like 120 horsepower, which was very adequate for a light car. And uh, they'd also bumped up the V8 engines as well to give them a little bit more pep because, of course, mid to late 60s, horsepower was the thing and every car had to have it. Um, you know, you had a choice of a three-speed manual, a four-speed manual, or an automatic, a whole variety of rear-end gears. Uh, you know, everything, again, working out pretty nice. You had an independent front suspension, you had springs in the back, a solid axle floating around there, and uh, a very, very simple, borrowed from the Falcon, easy to make, easy to produce, and uh, Ford, uh, you know, as a result, made an absolute ton of them. So, um, you know, there's really not much you can say. You could get into the Shelby stuff, you could get into the later Mustangs with their, you know, Boss 302s, the Boss 429s, the Mach 1s, the, 
uh, Cobra jets, and yeah, all that kind of stuff, and it's great. I mean, basically any engine Ford made ended up in the Mustang, with the exception of a four-cylinder, at least until, you know, 73 or 4 when that Mustang 2 came out. And uh, you could order it however the hell you wanted it, and that was part of what made it great. And then, of course, the Shelby engines were their own thing, some of them with twin four barrels and uh, just really, really neat stuff. And that's part of what cemented this car into automotive history. So I tell you what, let me get my crap in the trunk, then we're going to have a look at the interior and go for a spin. So uh, bear with me one moment. All right, I've got my tag in the back. Let me just say that I have to, you know, this is a really nice example. It's probably been since the late 80s that I drove one of these cars. A friend of mine had one. A uh, nice girl that I tried to date, but she wouldn't have any of it. You know, typical. Don't know why that is. I, for some reason, I'm absolute anathema to females. They just despise me. Uh, I've got other friends who they seem to like, but for whatever reason, they just dislike me, which is fine because, you know, the, at this stage in life, I'm happy it worked out. But uh, at the time, it was quite frustrating. She had this really nice turquoise 66, uh, which, uh, you know, when I drove, it felt like a piece of crap. Uh, but driving this one, I have to say, I get it. I start to understand it, why people bought so many of these things. You know, a car, to be successful, yeah, it had to look good. It had to have the right, you know, vibe when you walked in, but it also had to drive nice, because if it didn't, then uh, they just wouldn't buy it. And driving this thing, I sort of understand why people uh, bought these cars in droves. It's just a terrific cruiser, but anyway, we'll get into that. Let's have a look at the inside. And I think well, the inside was a big win for Ford and Iacocca. Uh, this one is quite simple. It's not one of the high option packages, but it's nice. And uh, it utilized a lot of parts from the Falcon, which again made it easy to produce, uh, while at the same time retaining its own vibe and feel. Uh, the door panels have this sort of lovely swept back thing with the uh, <laughs> almost looks like the air vents on the side with the lines and uh, you've got a uh, armrest here which is obviously fallen down that needs to get bolted up properly uh, you've got your door handle which is absolutely enormous and uh, a uh, rather big window crank there I mean, you used to bolt that in what the hell is that all about <sighs> anyway, uh, you could actually get a bench seat in these things, but it was an option, not standard. Standard, it came with the buckets, and uh, that was part of Iacocca's vision. Uh, you could also get something called the pony interior, which was quite nice. And uh, that had these little vinyl inlays of horses galloping around, which people seemed to dig. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of options available for this. Uh, in the back seat, you could fit three Canadians back there, but they're going to be pretty miserable, too is better and uh, they're going to be much more chipper that way. You had pretty good foot room. Uh, you know, what can you say? It's a vinyl bench seat. I do like the way that little wraparound rear plastic uh, interior light works. It's kind of cool. Uh, you've got these little swing back ashtrays left and right because of course everybody smoked back then and uh, window cranks nicely ensconced in chrome those windows for the uh, rear quarters and also the front and uh, of course, the top stows nicely, so absolutely lovely stuff. Uh, the steering wheel is nice and thin, uh, very, very sporty, like the you know, the holes for weight that are drilled in it. That must have been, you know, race inspired at the time. Uh, from what I understand, the original 64 and a half had this uh, tr ring for the horn, which was covering the Falcon. If you pulled it off, you'd see a Ford Falcon ring, which was kind of funny. Uh, but of course, by this time, they changed all that. And uh, I think it looks great. You have a pencil thin wheel, very, very nice and thin. You got a horn that works. Uh, you got this famous Mustang twin cove dash. You know, you've got this cove here, cove here, and that's a design feature that they kept going even till current. You know, it just seems that the retro look is a thing. And, uh, you know, every Mustang made since then has sort of paid some form of homage to this original one. Uh, you have a very nice gauge cluster. You got a fuel gauge, oil pressure, uh, 140 mile an hour speedo. You see just 70 
37 on the clock of this thing, and that's real. Uh, you got your uh, ammeter, your amps, your uh, draw and charge. You've got your temp gauge. Uh, the, you could also get a, um, a gauge pack, which would right here put up some more additional gauges for you, including a tachometer, and that came on the sportier versions and was one of the options that uh, Iacocca wanted to have. Uh, over here in a weird spot is your power top control. Works even with the key off. And uh, here is your heater and uh, AC, not AC, heater and vent controls, which, as I found out, still work great. It was a little bit chilly driving home last night with the top down, so I put the heat on, and man, you know, again, blew hot air out. Uh, AC in these years was kind of an afterthought. Uh, looks dealer installed, but I think it actually came from the factory, most of them. Either way, whatever. I'm sure some Mustang purists will correct me. Uh, but you can certainly see that it wasn't really part of the original design uh, where the vents would come through the dashboard. It was kind of like the Coolmeister and the old Mercedes that went underneath the dash. Uh, center console was an option. Uh, back here at the back, you have another ashtrays. The guys in the back seat have access to three different ashtrays. You absolutely have to love that. And then the front seat people have an ashtray up here if they want it. And uh, very commonly, this car has it. Somebody puts in kind of a uh, Bluetooth, you know, modern stereo uh, that, um, you know, gives you some tunes that go through your phone or whatever else while still maintaining that sort of classic look and uh, has a single speaker up there. Uh, you also have a glove box with a push button, uh, you know, big substantial affair that you could fit a lot of guns inside if you want to. Nice big Smith & Wesson revolver or whatever you need. Let's get the key in and fire this thing up. I find it strange that it's uh, the tumblers on this are upside down like the Chryslers. I, I thought that was only a Chrysler thing, but in this car, trunk and uh, whatever else are like that. I have absolutely no idea what this little thing is. Uh, seat at all. I have no idea. Somebody's going to tell me what that is but I'm not gonna screw with it right now because I'll probably break it. Uh, I also appreciate that this car has the automatic. If you're gonna have a six cylinder, you might as well have the automatic, and this one does, so let's fire it up. Yeah, you know, comes right to life, no issues, very nice, smooth running. Exactly what you'd want to hear from a uh, you know pedestrian six-cylinder car. You got some sun visors up here with some funky looking chrome levers to pull them back. You got a nice review mirror that has no frame on it. You know, nice 60s style. Uh, stainless wipers which look good. You got a nice uh, vista over the hood with creased fender edges on the left and right. And uh, all in all, it just feels good sitting in this car. From the moment I hopped in this thing and drove it home. I felt good. I felt nice. I mean, it really just was a lovely cruiser. Uh, you also get these great 60s style vent windows, which I love. They're great for smoke. And you get these little side view mirrors round. I don't know if this one would have originally come with the right side mirror, which would have been an option. Either way, there it is. And it's nice to have. I should even maybe direct it so I could use them. Uh, shifting wise, you just go very standard PRNDL and uh, away we go. This one, was, I, it also has power steering, which I appreciate. Didn't have to, and without it, it can be a pain in the ass to kind of move those front wheels. See how long it takes Peter's gate to open. If it opens at all, I don't hear any beeping, which you're supposed to hear. <laughs> I tell you, man, Peter has an endless issue with his gate. Absolutely endless. This thing never works right. He's always telling me, oh, okay, you gotta open it manually or you gotta do this. I mean, he just, the poor guy, he just needs to write a big check instead of pretending that he can fix it himself. Uh, I don't know if Dalton detailed this one over at Auto House. For the moment, the windshield looks pretty clear. Um, this morning, it was hazy going down on my night drive, but that was my fault. I drove through some sprinklers and I cleaned it off with a rag that I think was soaked with WD-40. Alright, you know, look, it's not a race car, this one. But it's peppy, it's responsive, it has a three-speed automatic, effortless steering. 
pretty good brakes. I actually, I'm ashamed to say I didn't check whether this was discs or drums, uh, but the way it stops, I suspect it as front discs. And uh, it's just a lovely car to cruise. And let me very quickly on this drive get into why these cars make such terrific classics. They're easy. I mean, so many classics are difficult. There's no parts, there's stuff you have to fabricate, there's uh, just a variety of issues you have to contend with. Not so on this Mustang. And of course, that's because they sold a million of them by the time the second production year rolled around. There is nothing on this car that can't be ordered. Engine, uh, drivetrain, body, interior, everything. It's all available. Uh, it's just a very simple classic car to own. And for a guy who wants a classic car without any of the devotion that you have to get, you know, let's say you have a 66 Toronado, that's going to require a lot of devotion. This car won't. Any mechanic can maintain it. Most of the parts you could still buy at Advance Auto. And uh, you could just leave it on a little trickle charger in your garage. You know, keep the oil changed, keep it up to date, and drive it to the country club, golf course, Asian massage, or strip club. And you're going to do fine. It's just a great, easy car to own. And frankly, that's why they make terrific first classic cars, and also classic cars for guys who just want one without any of the trouble. So yeah, you're not gonna set any land speed records, but it's got enough pep to go down the road. The six cylinder version is a lot cheaper. Uh, these things went through a big price increase lately, which I think is weird considering how many of them they made. But, uh, you know, who am I to argue with the market? Uh, runs and drives nice, and all in all, just a really fun cruiser to own. And it's instantly iconic to anyone who looks at it. Uh, it makes women swoon, and uh, you get a lot of thumbs up while you're driving around. So, uh, many thanks to Auto House for providing this one to me. Uh, again, this is a 66 convertible, 77,000 miles, and man, what a sweetheart. Uh, this one is one that I would, you know, I wouldn't be offended to have in my garage at all. It's just a great driving car, and I love it. If you have an interest, give those guys a call, 239-263-8500, or on the web at autohousenaples.com. Many thanks to those guys, good guys down there. Uh, again, I got a bunch of cars to do, Cosworth Vegas, Belvedere's, Hippie Vans, Stoner Vans, you name it. And uh, I'm going to try and get them coming as soon as I can. Thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.